Hey, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Well, we are waiting for other participants to join. I think maybe we could start yeah, to our webinar today. So thank you for taking our time to join to this webinar, uh, our yeah, IWA webinar for, with the topic of managing disinfection and byproduct for safe water. So maybe let me just quickly go through with you today's agenda. So I'm Xin Gao uh, from Xilin, uh, located in Singapore. I'm also part of the uh, IWA Disinfection Specialist Group. So today we will have two professors to go through with us about their insights in these topics. And after this, we will follow up a Q&A and discussion. Then we will close this webinar. So before we move to the presentation, please just allow, allow me to go through some practical yes, uh, items of the webinar. So first, the webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA Connect, uh, Connect Plus platform and IWA Network website with the slides and the other information. And also please be aware yeah, that the opinions, hypothesis, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials as the sole responsibility of our speakers at the do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Um, in case you want to interact with the speakers during the presentation, uh, so please just use our use the functions in the in Zoom. So either you, you want to raise your general request through chat box uh, or for the interact to interact uh, with our speakers. If in case you have some specific questions you want to ask at get answer, then please use Q at a box. So please also allow me to give you a brief introduction of our disinfection specialist group. So the group uh, aims to create exchange and transfer the knowledge and experience of disinfection related issues in water with water sludge or extra. The disinfection SG strategic plan includes reinvigorating its member our membership participa participation, encouraging the exchange of our knowledge and inspiring the collaboration between water industry, academia, government, and the public. The group encourage achievement in disinfection to include practical solutions for the low income countries as well as lead as leading edge technologies and series. So therefore we organize a couple of activities to engage to ensure this engagement. Uh, there will be an upcoming our this is a fourth international conference uh, in this October uh, in the Amaria Spain. So we look forward to your participation at the for the IWA member when you register, you also uh, get can ten percent your discount. So it's for just small promotion of the conference. Okay. So um, today we have the pleasure to have our two speakers, um, Prof. Yang Xin from Sun Yat-sen University and Prof. Yang Mengting from Shenzhen University. I will give you more detailed introduction of their bio when we. Yeah, move to the, the, the presentation. So the first speaker for today will be Professor Yang Mengting uh, from Shenzhen University. So for Professor Yang Mengting, she has a rich experience uh, in this domain. Uh, she has been investigating disinfection by products since 2008. She has been responsible for nine projects, including two national Natural Science Foundation of China project and has published 24 articles, including six ESNT articles and four WR articles as the first author or responding author. Um, additionally, she owns the 2022 ESNT Excellence in Review Award. So let's please welcome Prof. Mountain Yang to give her presentation. So Prof. Yang, you will have uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone all over the world. It's a great pleasure to be here to give you um, a pre my presentation. 
Okay, let's start. Oh, okay, as we all know, disinfection is an effective measure to protect human beings from waterborne diseases. However, disinfectants can react with natural organic matter and anthropogenic contaminants in source water or wastewater to form unwanted disinfection byproducts, which are harmful to uh, bioorganisms. And we know that commonly known DBPs, uh, such as the trihalomycin, hyaluracetic acid, hyaluracetamide, and et cetera, are commonly detected and quantified at nanogram per liter or um, to micro, um, microgram per liter. Recently, tremendous efforts have been um, have been made to explore new DBPs, new emerging DBPs, especially for those halogenated aromatic DBPs. And why is this group is in so important? Uh, one major reason is that you can identify and detect them um, in drinking water and wastewater, as well as swimming pool water. Another major reason is that according to our previous uh, in investigation, we found that um, uh, you can see that this, this is the uh, toxicity data, and this yellow line represents the commonly known DBP, uh, such as aliphatic DBPs, and the left uh, lines represent the new emerging aromatic DBPs. We can see that they are much more toxic than those commonly known DBPs. So th those new uh, aromatic DBPs possess extremely high toxicity that um, compared with to the uh, aliphatic DBPs. Uh, interesting, a recent study conducted by um, Dr. Susan Richardson, they found that um, the natural genus DBP and aldinated LD DBPs are uh, key DBP toxicity drivers in drinking water across the United States. However, only aliphatic DBPs were involved in their studies. So they didn't test uh, uh, those new emergent uh, aromatic DBPs. Accordingly, we try to consider both aliphatic and aromatic DBPs together. Initially, we, we collected chlorinated drinking water samples from six drinking water treatment plants or their distribution system in the mega city of Shenzhen, which is located in southern China. And in each sample, the concentration of 56 halogenated DBPs uh, belong to 11 um, categories were measured. We can see that they are typical uh, large groups of DBPs. For the aromatic DBPs, we can see that. Oh, sorry. It's too quickly. For the aromatic DBPs, from the pie chart, we can see that uh, the Halonitrophenol play an important role in both total concentration and total calculated cytotoxicity. Within the subgroup, halonitrophenol, 2,6-dichlorophenol exhibits the highest percentage, indicating that it is the major toxicity driver among other aromatic DBPs. And for aliphatic DBPs, although trihalomycin are the dominant subgroup in terms of concentration, the toxicity driver uh, was found to be haloacetonitrile. That you can see, they show the highest percentage within this part, a pie chart. And notably, toxicity drivers identify dif differ from various toxicity, because when we change the endpoint to general toxicity, the toxicity driver was uh, found to be the haloacetic acid. How about if we put the uh, aliphatic DBPs and aromatic DBPs together, which, which one should be the key large group of DBP? And, and you can see that from this figure, both concentration uh, percentage and the calculated cytotoxicity percentage suggest that the contribution of aliphatic DBPs corresponding to this red one, which are significantly higher than the uh, than, than the uh, aromatic DBPs. So what if uh, we use another uh, uh, endpoint such as developmental toxicity? Then we can see that um, we can see that if we change to another endpoint, 
although the data increased significantly. However, the developmental toxicity endpoint also show a similar trend that the contribution of aromatic DBPs was significantly lower than the contribution of aliphatic uh, um, haloacetic acid, that, that is the aliphatic DBPs. This is strange because um, a recent study conducted by um, Professor Xiang Ru Zhang from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, their group recently demonstrated that if we separate the drinking water extracts into aliphatic fractions and aromatic fractions, and without knowing their specific uh, compositions, aromatic fractions um, uh, show both higher TOX concentration level and developmental toxicity than the aliphatic fractions. So we try to find the reason for the inconsistency. In general, total organic halogen can reflect the overall formation of DBPs, which should consist of aliphatic DBPs and aromatic DBPs. Thus, DBP, uh, TOX should be closely related to both aromatic DBPs and aliphatic DBPs. However, according to the statistic analysis, we can see that here you can notice that the, uh, the vectors between uh, there's a small and acute, acute angle between the vectors of TOX and the aliphatic uh, DBPs. Well, vectors between the, uh, between the TOX and aromatic DBPs approximately at right angle to each, each other. Also, TOX shows significantly positive correlation with most of aliphatic DBPs, but no aromatic DBPs. In addition, the total concentration we can see here of the measured aromatic DBPs, uh, here represent the aliphatic DBPs, uh, and here is the aliphatic DBPs. We can see that their contribution was significantly different. The total concentration of the measured aromatic DBPs were less than 1% of the TOX. Well, the aliphatic DBPs correspond to over um, 46 to 86% of the TOX. Therefore, uh, this, this uh, data suggests that current selected aromatic DBPs are insufficient to represent the overall aromatic DBPs. To further ensure, sorry, it's so quick. To further ensure that the calculated toxicity contribution reflects the real situation, we extracted water samples and used the in vitro toxicity, CHO cell cycle toxicity, to assess the overall toxicity. Interestingly, we can find that the CTI value of, obtained from the overall cell toxicity, um, which uh, is, which is highly correlated with the calculated cytotoxicity, toxicity, which is support, supports the rationale for using the calculated toxicity, cytotoxicity. toxicity. Also, we can see another important point that is the, uh, the CTI value also show a high uh, correlation with the formation of the total aliphatic DBPs. However, you, uh, if we change to the total aromatic DBPs, you can see there's no uh, correlation. This further suggests that the current selected individual aromatic DBPs are insufficient. Considering that the current popular aromatic DBPs cannot explain the high toxicity contribution to overall toxicity, we choose tannic acid as a model compound and simulated its biodegradation to investigate whether numerous new aromatic DBPs could be formed. We choose these substances because um, it is ubiquitous, ubiquitously occurred in the uh, source water and wastewater. Interestingly, by using a powerful non-target method with the UPLC TQMS instrument, which is also known as the precursor and scan method, we detected many new halogenated DBPs. You can see here, coupled with additional techniques such as product and scan, and high-resolution mass spectrometry, we have proposed and identified dozens of new DBPs. And this table summarizes those of compounds. And here you can see many aromatic DBPs. Also, here are some aromatic DBPs. And some of them have been reported previously, 
such as this halophenol and halonitrophenol. But most of them are, uh, we, we report it for the first time. Based on the pro proposed and identified structure, we also elucidate their transformation mechanism. You can see here, um, um, start from the tannic acid. It can um, chemically or enzymatically hydrolyze to digalic acid, followed by garlic acid. Then subsequently, it uh, suffers from the electrophilic substitution and attacked by the HOX, followed by hydrolysis, decarboxylation, and form a series of different new emerging halogenated uh, emerging aromatic DBPs. Because most of these compounds are new, uh, newly identified DBPs, so standard compounds of, of them are not commercially available. Therefore, we use, uh, if we want to know their toxicity potencies, we use our previously developed QSA models to uh, predict their toxicity. And here is the lollipop, uh, here is the lollipop um, data for, for their toxicity. Uh, and if uh, the EC50 value is high, uh, which means that the, the, um, the toxicity potencies should be lower. And compare with those commonly known DBPs, tribromoacetic acid, and some new, uh, newly identified aromatic DBPs, such as 2,5-dibromo, uh, dihydroquinose, you can see that most of uh, newly identified aromatic DBPs are much more toxic than those kind of DBPs. In conclusion, while we have uncovered some intriguing findings, there's a substantial work to be done. We know that current reported aromatic DBPs are insufficient to represent the overall aromatic DBPs. The composition of TOX remaining largely unknown and will be identified successfully in the future due to the improvement of analytical techniques. Um, in addition, databases of toxicity potencies of individual DBPs and prediction models need further development. Then, if we can have more data involved, we, we, we understand uh, more aromatic DBPs and aliphatic DBPs. We can combine the analysis of calculated toxicity and experimental overall toxicity of real water samples can be conducted in the future studies. If the calculated toxicity of a given individual aromatic DBPs correlates well with the overall toxicity of aromatic fraction, a suspected toxicity driver for aromatic DBPs can be found. And I also suggest that you may use EDA method, um, which is a very popular uh, method we call effective directed analysis which has been used in, uh, as a useful tool in finding priority pollu uh, pollutants. So we can also use such kind of method in our DBP area. That's all for my today's presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Hey, thank you, Professor Meng Yang. Yes, so for your insightful sharing on the arom aromatic disinfection byproduct. Uh, so, uh, let's welcome to our the next speaker, the Professor Xin Yang. Uh, Prof. Xin Yang is now a professor at the School of Environmental Science at, at Engineering at Sun Yat-sen Yat University. She received a bachelor degree in Environmental Science from Nankai University in 2020, 2002 and op obtained her MPhil at a PhD degree in Environmental Engineering from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology at 2004 and 2007, respectively. She was a postdoc fellow working with uh, Professor Philip Singer, Singer at the University of North Carolina at uh, Capel Hill between 2007 and 2009. Then she joined the Sun Yat-sen University in 2010. She has published over 100 SCI papers at God's National Funds for Distinguished Young Scientists in 2016. Her research focused on the formation mechanisms and control strategies of disinfection byproducts in water treatment at the phase of emerging micropollutants in aqueous environment. So today, Pro Professor Yang Xin will share with us 
her insights in understanding the radical involved reactions of dissolved organic matters, kinetics at the disinfection byproduct formation. So yeah, please <laughs> let's welcome Prof. Xinyang for her presentation. You will have 15 minutes, Prof. Yang. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's my greatest honor to be here to give a pre presentation about our recent findings of the radicals and dissolved organic matter. So I think I want to talk about what the, uh, see? I want to give a brief introduction about what is dissolved organic matter. So it is popularly present in water and it includes, it's a very complic complicated mixture. It's include fulvic acid, humic acid. So it's not ho homogeneous and its molecular weight has, is very, have a very large range. And also it's have very uh, uh, diverse functional groups. So the salts could from the natural, uh, it's called a natural organic matter or from the wastewater effluent and or from the algae. So basically, if you look at the uh, dissolved organic matter in the world, it's very popular in the surface water or groundwater at milligram per liter. So basically, DOM itself is not toxic at all. But in the water treatment process, the DOM can react with disinfectant or oxidants, so it could form disinfection byproducts. So basically, because its concentration is very high in water, so the formation of these DBPs actually causes a big problem. So we all know that DBPs has many uh, adverse uh, outcomes, and including like the blood cancer or the miscarriages. So the researchers has been working for decades to understand what's going on and how the DBPs are formed. So uh, if we look at the water treatment process, so we previously we used like the, the oxidants like free chlorine, ozone, or uh, chlorine dioxide in the water treatment. But in recent decades, people start to use more AOP processes because they want to uh, set up the multi-barrier processes and also want to abate the emerging contaminants. So in this case, they try to generate the radicals, which has very high oxidation potential. So they want to remove those persistent mycoproteins. So they have, there are different um, types of procedures to generate radicals. Like you use UV radiation, you, such as UV H2, UV persulfate, or UV chlorine process. So in these cases, the, um, like the chlorine bromine radicals will be formed. And also in the electrochemical treatment, it's also include the radical process. So we can see here that they, they can they could generate the hydroxyl radicals or chlorine radicals. So this, because the presence of dissolved organic matter, their concentration are at a milligram per liter. So they could also react with these radicals. So from the figure here, you can clearly see that actually is a very significant scavenger of the, of the radicals. So their reaction cannot be neglected. And also because you have the different types of the radicals here, including like halogen radicals, they could react with UM and also form the transformation byproducts. So maybe some of them, they could contain halogen and they could be toxic. And on the other hand, they could be transformed to the intermediate byproducts. But in any cases, the disinfection is the final process. So the transformed DOM could react differently with the disinfectant to form DBPs. Well, if we look at the uh, research history, so basically people has put a lot of efforts to understand what's going on about this uh, disinfectant, such as free chlorine, Ozone nation, ozone and chlorine dioxide. How could they react with dissolved organic matter? And how could they, their reaction result in the formation of DBPs? However, for these radical involved processes, because the reaction actually are very fast, they occur at nanoseconds to microseconds. So we do not have very good understanding about their kinetics and whether they could react with DOM to form toxic byproducts. So 
To understand these questions, uh, our group focused on the radicals and the DOM reactions. So here I want to introduce which, which method we use. So first we get different types of DOM. We uh, is from some of them are bought from the International Humic Substances Society, and some of them are extracted from algae, and some of them are from the affluent, and some of the organic matter assays are provided by Professor Paul Westhoff from Arizona State University. So basically the DOM cover a wide range of different types and different areas. And then because the radical reaction are very fast, so if you want to know their how, what's the kinetics here, we use the laser flash photolysis. So in this instrument, there is a laser which can uh, uh, can irradiate the sample uh, at uh, use the pulse mode. So then in this case, the the oxidants in the end of the irradiation can generate radicals, and the radicals actually they have absorbance here and then they disappear quickly. But we can track their changes at nanoseconds to microseconds. By tracking their changes in the presence and without the presence of dissolved organic matter, we can actually um, uh, solve these, these curves and to get the kinetics directly. So by using this method, here are the results we obtain. So for the uh, halogen, for the chlorine radicals, actually it's reacted very fast. It's for the uh, two hydroxyl radicals. And uh, for the uh, dichlorine radical, uh, it's a little bit less, but still you can see they, they all have a very um, fast reaction rate with the dissolved organic matter. And because we have about like 20 dissolved organic matter, so we try to set up their correlations and then we found that uh, for the SUVA value, which is an indicator about the aromaticity, so the higher the aromatic contents, actually the reaction rate constant are higher. So which means that these uh, aromatic contents are the very uh, important ones to react with these radicals. And then we use this um, direction system, we can detect the formation of total organic chlorine. And in both the chlorine radical reaction systems and also dichlorine uh, radical reaction systems. So basically, you can see their formation can reach like micromolar levels. So still, the, the higher the aromatic contents, the higher the formation. So this also indicates that aromatic moieties of the DOM are important precursors of TOCL in the radical reactions. So, and then we, we use some model compounds to try to understand how these DBPs are formed. So we can get some intermediate uh, transient spectra. And uh, based on all of this information together, we found that actually there are different pathways to form these chlorine and chlorinated DBPs. So either the chlorine can directly uh, from the direct addition pathway all from the single electron transfer pathway and also the hydrogen abstraction pathway. From this intermediate, they could further react with these radicals to generate it, the chlor organic uh, chlorinated uh, compounds. Well, um, the different thing is that for the bromine radicals, the product actually is bromine. We cannot detect very high concentration of TOBr. So this is very different with the chlorine radicals. So the reason could be called that because the bromine radical has very large size. So the, uh, their uh, addition intermediates are not very stable. So basically they are not going to the pathway to form this organic bromine. So that's the different. Okay, so besides this halogen radical, there are other radicals which do not form the halogenated DBPs directly, but they can react with dissolved organic matter to change their properties. So here we use sulfate as an example because it is known to react with uh, mainly via the single electron transfer pathway. So we want to see what's going on here. But we can see that actually by reacting the sulfate radical with dissolved organic matter, you can see the DOC concentration actually are decreasing. The UV absorbance also decreasing. But 
we can see the DBP formation potential, however, increased. So this actually surprised us. So basically because the concentration of DOM already had uh, like about 30% decrease, but you can see the significant increase of the uh, chloroform and uh, the total organic chlorine. So which means that by reacting the, the radical reactions with dissolved organic matter, maybe some mm, functional groups has been transformed and they are more DBP precursors. And by using the FTIR tool, and we use the sulfate radical and also other radicals, they mainly proceed with the single electron transfer pathway. So we see a, um, a phenomenon in common, which is that this uh, carbonyl group all increased in different NOM and after the treatment of these different types of the radicals. So, and then we think we also use the NMR and we find a similar phenomenon. So after these reactions of the radicals, we all see the increases in the carbonyl contents. And then we use the um, aromatic alcohols and aromatic contents as the model compounds to, to testify their DBP formation potential. So we know that the aromatic alcohol can be transformed to aromatic ketone by via uh, by reacting with the sulfate radical via the electron transfer pathway. So from the, this figure, you can see that after this transformation, the from the the generation of the chloroform can be significantly increased. So this could be one reason that the DOM actually after the transformation they could form more DBPs. So by summarize all of these uh, findings, we see okay maybe they have the decoupled decarboxylation process, which caused the DOC decrease, but however, the, the transformation of other functional groups like the alcohol to ketone transformation, actually they could form more DPPs. So um, I want to summarize the presentation. So I think we set up a method to quickly, um, to, to uh, for the, uh, to get the kinetics of the DOM and the radicals. And then we get a lot of data. So here, I only show you the kinetics data about the DOM and the radicals. We also have a live database about the radicals and the model compounds. So basically it's give us more information about what's going on about these groups and the, the radicals. And then for the reaction mechanisms, for the chlorine radicals, uh, when they react with dissolved organic matter, they could form organic chlorine. But for bromine radicals, they will not form organic bromine. And for the other radicals, they could transform DOM and maybe they could generate more DBP during the subsequent chlorination process. And uh, I want to introduce a review paper of mine and we worked together with uh, Fernando and Paul so this is a review paper about our understanding about the DOM. So we put a lot of information about what's the role of DOM in the uh, oxidation process. They could, you know, um, uh, consume the radicals. They could affect the removal of the pollutants. They could also generate the toxic byproducts. So if you are interested, maybe you can go ahead to read more and get more information about this. And with that, I want to thank the funding from the National Natural Science Foundation of China and also thank Professor Paul Westhoff uh, for providing us a lot of uh, DOM isolates. So uh, with all of that, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Yanxin, for your very insightful introduction of the, your, regarding this uh, dissolved organic matter, you know, this uh, kinetics and also the DPP formation. So after you're listening to this wonderful presentation from two professors, I believe all of us actually really expect to the Q and A you know, the session. Actually, there are already some questions yeah, flow to the yeah, in the queue. But I do encourage if you have any question you want to interact with the uh, the presenters, please do submit from the Q and A the panel. So the first question is from um. Dimakasos uh, Sema, 
I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, so I think it maybe could be easier to um prof uh Yang Mengting or Prof Yangxin. So it's the question is: Are there any developments on DBP monitoring? For example, adding the emerging DBPs to a current standards or monitoring protocols, especially for drinking water. Okay, I, I may not have a good answer. I try to solve this problem. Uh, actually, uh, you know that there are many new emerging um, halogenated DBPs were identified um, continually. However, uh, for the uh, during the regulation for monitoring, uh, currently we do not have ma uh, much um, uh, for regulation agency. We do, uh, they do not have uh, many standards to be developed recently. Uh, however, um, I know that in the United States and Europe, they are considering to inc uh, inclusion of additional DBPs in drinking water regulations. For instance, the US EPA, uh, they will periodically review the updates in contaminants um, uh, in its, uh, the, to review, the, uh, review and updates its contaminants candidate list, which we call CCL, which identify contaminants that may require regulation in the future. So emerging DBP have been featured on this list, indicating potential future regulation. So I, I, I don't know if I answer your questions. <laughs> hey, thank you. Yeah, Prof. I think it's also means that we have lots of work to do since uh, you're why we get together, you're here you know, to discuss and explore further. If, if so, Prof. Yanshi, may I check if there's anything else to add? Otherwise, I may move to the next question. I, I think I have no other. Um, I think it's okay. I, 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 the answer already is already very fine. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So, next question, uh, I think it's also uh, from yeah, um, Demacaso regarding where can I find the work papers from uh, the two presenters? Uh, so maybe I could share a little bit and uh, see if two professors have anything to add. So after the webinar and uh, the record the recording together with the slides, uh, use the website. Uh, in the deck, they actually some information regarding your the, the URL link to the web page to the professors. Uh, so yeah, anything you want to add, uh, Prof. Yangting or Yamantin or Prof. Yanjin regarding this question. So where if the audience want to find more regarding your work and your publication, so where is this? Maybe the simplest way is you search our names in, in the Google Scholar and you will find our work. I, I leave a web page on my last PPT slide. So basically we will put on our uh, uh, publish the papers all over there. So there is a website. So if you can search from name and also university, I guess you can find it online. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. So I hope this question be well addressed. So let's move to the next one. I uh, think same question. Yeah, same from uh, Jose Dimancaso. So the question is, where can I find the work? Uh, you know, the updated list of DPPs at the emerging DPPs. So where could be the results? Um, to the best of my knowledge, I think there's no um, whole list for the updated DPPs. However, I can share some reference for you that is uh, about review. Uh, some review paper uh, may include uh, many new updated uh, halogenated DPPs. Okay, I, I will share with you later. Okay, thank you. So if you got a chance, maybe you could type this uh, your in the QA okay. chat box. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for yeah, Yamon team. Okay, so let's move to next one. The question from Wong Hai. Uh so the question is uh actually regarding uh the um uh, I think it's uh, yeah, just uh yeah, specific to Prof Yamon team. So in recent years, students of uh, yeah, 
halogenated compounds were detected by using LC uh, HRMs. However, very few, very few compounds can be verified and confirmed due to a lack of commercial standards. This could sig significantly hammer the identification and the toxi toxicity assessment of new DBPs. How could researchers better solve this problem? Okay, very good questions. Um, yeah. I can Perfect. share you one of my experience. Um, I remember about eight years ago, we found a new DBP called new DBP called oh ten years ago called tetrabromoperol, and we are quite sure it is tetrabromoperol. However, from the uh, many uh, commercially available standards, they are not available. So we try to synthesize in our lab, and uh, uh, you know that uh, if you synthesize, there there's a, a, a mixture, and we cannot get the pure compound. Then we use the HPLC uh, to separate the uh, pure compound and the other other things, and to uh, then to uh, uh, repeat many times and get some powder. Do the toxicity bear I see. That is one way. However, we think that this way is very complex and um, very laborious. That is, we can use the QSA model. That is, quite, um, uh, that is, we can use the based on the uh, toxicity of previously reported data. We can uh, try to develop some models. Then, if we find some new DBPs, we can use the developed model to do the prediction. So, am I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Prof. Yamantin. So, well, I think the uh, two professors are addressing you the questions from, from us. So, if you, in case you feel that you want your more information, please just uh, yeah, do submit your follow-up question in the Q&A panel, so we will follow up. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's move to the next one. Uh, the question is from from Joyce from yeah, Masaruku Joyce. Uh, so the question is actually regarding your say, I think the research your scope in terms of uh, maybe the cross-reaching collaboration. So do you maybe it's two, yeah, for the two professors, do you have any plan? to extend such research to other countries? If yes, which country in your in your mind? And what are the criteria? I think it's maybe regarding some cross use country collaboration. Is something regarding this? It's from my my personal use guess. Uh, I think uh, we are open for any collaboration opportunities. So basically, I have already uh, have very good collaboration with uh, professors like in US and also in Europe. So and also there are quite a lot of uh, either paper publication together or also the joint projects. So I think we are more uh, we are, we would like to be open minded and welcome to any uh, collaboration opportunities. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Prof. Yanxin. Okay, so Prof. Yanxin, any, any, anything you want to add? Or no, I'll just move I to the next one. Sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So let's move to the next one. There we, we have three questions from Bessem Soma. So the first one is, uh, say, within the post-treatment of this yeah, desalinated water, how to establish or introduce a holistic approach investigating disinfection technology with other critical processes, such uh, at the at foaming, at the at scaling materials. I didn't catch the question very well. So maybe Mengting, do you have any answer for that? Okay, I'm still thinking. I I, I would personally guess, you know, just, uh, of course, uh, Bessam, if you could uh, type and provide more background, it will be highly appreciated. Uh, just in our destination, you either use membrane or other filter. So there will 
yeah, maybe yeah, folks can I follow me or yeah, or scared or scary, yeah, just the, the scaling issue. So therefore, how you know, our disinfection technology, you know, this maybe yeah could uh, yeah play some some roles here. Yeah, this kind of like, uh, oh. yeah, I would guess maybe it's regarding you know, this this yeah this angle. So it's about the the disinfection process for the desalination. Yeah, desalination. Yeah, post treatment of the desalinated water. Post treatment. So that means uh, yeah. after the desalination process, it's already been clean, and then. Uh, yeah, maybe after memory or after filter. I see. So yeah. from my mind is I I know that uh, it seems like. The bromide sometimes could be a problem because from the desalination process, the DOC has been greatly reduced. But maybe uh, the bromide is, even though it's reduced, but the concentration still, I do not remember the value exactly, but still, like the bromide concentration is still uh, not very low yet. So basically, uh, I think when we use either chlorination or ozonation process, maybe we need to pay attention about the bromination. Uh, the brominated DBP's formation. So I think it really depends on the uh, water quality after desalination. Uh, yeah, but it, but <laughs> like uh, which disinfection, disinfection process you use still <laughs> could generate some specific DBPs, I guess, yeah. Hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you, yeah, Prof. Yanxin. Uh, so, Prof. Yamanti, anything else you want to add? Or uh, maybe I can answer the second question. Uh, what could be the most acceptable piping materials? Uh, uh, in fact, I do not investigate the piping materials about uh, and, and react with the disinfectant. However, I can share my previous um, experience uh, regarding how the pipe material affects the formed disinfection byproduct. Mm -hmm. Um, because last year we also published a paper on the ESMT, and we found that the ZVI uh, um, coupled with the copper copper piper, uh, they can um, uh, reduce the formed the uh, disinfection byproducts through the how, how to say uh, reduction reactions. Uh, so I, I will su uh, suggest I would suggest you may ask my, uh, our previous uh, the previous reference because it's really interesting. Uh, you, you know that, you know, we, we know that after uh, the disinfection formed, how can we eliminate them? If we can eliminate as, more, as much as we can, their toxicity can be, uh, can be reduced. So well, during, um, their trans uh, during their distribution, uh, we can still uh, reduce the formed disinfection byproducts. So maybe you can use copper or CVI pipes, I think. Okay, yeah, thank you, yeah, Prof. MMT. So the last question uh, from SM is, uh, since we talk about so the kinetics, we also say DBP formation. So yeah, we'd like to understand which software uh, are advanced to cover the kinetics of DBP's formation at the water, production size at within the water level. Uh, you mean the DBP formation kinetics? Uh, yeah, for software, yeah. I, so do you use digital tool or? Actually, if you talk about the kinetics uh, for the uh, the reaction, re reaction kinetics, basically we can, we track the absorbance decreases with different concentration of the reactants. And then we can use, you just use Excel, basically we can get the answer. But for the DBP formation, uh, it's more like we, uh, after the reaction, we get them directly and uh, analyze them. So basically for the DBP formation, we did not see the kinetics about the DBP formation. So um, I, I don't know if I, uh, I give the right answer or not, but for the reaction rate constant, that's about the kinetics of the radicals. Basically, we can, uh, it, we do not have, need any special software. Basically, that is a special instrument. So, but for the mm -hmm. data analysis is we can just use Excel that basically we can get the answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
Prof. Uh, Yanxin. So actually, um, Basim, just to add uh, some supplementary information regarding his first question. Uh, actually, actually, I think it's regarding the bromide, because all we know that for distillation, the bromide is always a problem within the reverse osmosis. Uh, and also within the thermal process, uh, so sometimes people consume huge amounts of anti-scaling and anti-folding chemicals. So there must be some interaction between those disinfectants at these materials. So I think this is uh, the question from Basim C. If there is become yeah, bring some yeah awareness to us as a researcher. Or maybe it's an area we yeah just are supposed to explore in the future or um Meng Ting, do you want father in law? Yeah. I will do the trial. So oh yes, I agree. Actually for the um membrane process and also maybe like the the questions mentioned about the thermal processes, if you put oxidants or you put disinfectants over there, basically there could be reactions happening over there. So the DBP formation could be a problem there. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's about all about like the, the the chemistry. So because chlorine is very active, and if you have precursors, uh, even you know the the organics or inorganics over there, they could generate some uh, uh, byproducts over there. So I think it's very. Uh, I think for this process, it could also generate DBPs. Okay, yeah, thank you, Prof. Yanxin. And also regarding the timing, uh, actually we have really a few minutes left. So maybe I think we could uh, you have five more minutes you know, for the Q&A. Then, yeah, we have to move to yeah, close the webinar. So if there are any questions we have got a chance to answer, uh, we will follow up, see how to address either by, you know, by message or in other formats. So let's move to the next one, the question from uh, Ray Martins. So do you think the legislation should consider the arom yeah, aroma yeah, aromatic DBPs or in fact, yeah, the aliphatic DBPs are more representative and more toxic? Should we keep focusing on THMs, HS or HACNs? So I think maybe a question yeah. for you, Prof. Okay. Yeah, or, or you are okay, Prof. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I think that uh, maybe in the future we definitely should consider to to legislation um, for uh, the aromatic DBPs because as we just mentioned that if we uh, without no uh, specific compound if we just roughly separate the uh, DBP mixture into aromatic and aliphatic DBPs the aromatic fraction shows significantly higher than the aliphatic DBPs. However, the question. Uh, currently, is that we do not know which one, which individual and, and uh, aromatic DBPs should be focused on. So, um, uh, future work, I think we, we need to find out which one is the most important one. And aliphatic DBPs, we can still not ignore them because they still uh, pose a very high contribution to the overall toxicity. However, um, uh, compared to tri uh, tri uh, THMs, I think haloacetonitrile should be should be the key points we should pay more attention because uh, many previous studies in uh, some some someone uh, is maybe conducted by uh, Dr. Michael Plewa and our group also did many um, studies to finding the forcing agent. We found the contribution when you consider both toxicity potencies and concentration. Their contribution are much higher than the trihalomethines. And that answer your question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Prof. Amonti. Yeah. Okay. So, should we move to the next one? I think it's a question from Acer. So, just I think it's a generic one. So, if the DPPs um, pose adverse effects on health, if so, what will be the operative disinfection to be used? It really depends on what type of DBP we are talking, but uh, just want to yeah learn the two professors. If you have any further insights to answer this question? Yeah, a lot of choices. For example, ozone, UV, or uh, something else. I think there are many many things. Uh, however, we know that ozone and UV, they do not have residual chlorine. 
So sometimes we need to um, add some chlorine, residual chlorine, to maintain the, uh, uh, how to say, the passenger, to control the pathogens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Your coins have two sides. So, yeah, we have to, yeah, just to really, yeah, treat it case by case at the, yeah, consider chemical or non chemical, yeah, solutions here. So, uh, yeah, I assume we have, yeah, a few minutes, maybe take, yeah, one or two more. So, next one is from, uh, Jalila. So, it's, uh, uh, the question is, could you please share your experience whether detected aromatic at the, Aliphatic emerging DPPs are prone to removal on subsequent absorption process that follows oxidation or presented AOPs. Prone to removal. Can Professor Xinyang have some ideas? Uh, let me see. Um, I think um, from the papers actually I learned, it seems that after the AOPs, maybe the DBPs are more prone to be biodegraded. So, and also I think maybe from Xiang Ruzhang's experience, he tells that after the chlorination, actually the DOM are better removed than uh, better removed by using GAC absorption. So, and it's much better for this process to remove the DBP precursors by using GAC first and uh, followed by chlorination. So I think it really depends because for the AOP sector is transfer the large molecular weight uh, precursor to smaller ones. And so whether it's, it's better to remove by absorption or not, I think it really depends, but I think maybe biodegradation seems to be a, a nice way actually to remove a lot of oxygenated DBPs. So I think like like ozonation or JC or other like uh, AOPs followed by bio biodegrad bio JC by BAC. So I think uh, for for the question you asked, maybe we need uh, further uh, studies to get a solid answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you to professors. Uh, I think maybe let, let's see if we can take the last one. So from the Lawrence, the question. Uh, so for the use of copper and the desalination is commonly used. Is there a way to address with regards to ORP and perhaps um, manipulate the formation kinetics instead? I'm not very familiar with the the using of copper as a disinfectant, so I'm not sure whether they could form any DVPs or not. Sorry about that. I don't okay, know. Laura, if I think maybe Lawrence could uh, yeah, provide more background information than we could consider to address your know, offline regarding this. So let's say the perhaps they just next they take last one from Chow. Is AOP processes have been applied in water industry in Europe, US, and China now? How about the pro and, pros and cons of AO, AOP for DBP control? What are the barriers of this process? How about the perspective? Um, well, I think uh, the AOP actually is increasingly uh, used uh, in the countries. I think the major concern is to control like the algae uh, and other problems. So that's they are used they use the AOP actually to remove the taste and other products. So but the application of AOP is not intensely applied to remove DBP. But we can take advantage of this process to also uh, maybe remove some of the DBP precursors. But based on our understanding, it seems like the 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 AOP actually can decrease the concentration of the DOM, but however, it sometimes it could increase the formation of some DBPs. So I think the application of the AOP maybe have to be used together with like biodegradation or absorption process together. So it has to be used uh, with other processes to, you know, to 
remove not only the concentration of DOM, but also the DBP precursors, because there's really some functional group, they are very uh, effective to generate the DBPs. So I think uh, because like the taste and other problem is, is uh, get a lot of attention here. So sometimes we have to use this process. So, but I think it's also an opportunity to um, apply the AOP and um, for the DBP control, but we do need to combine this process together. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Prof. Anshin. Last and now we are, yeah, just exactly on time. So yeah, i move to maybe close our today's webinar. So I would really like to take this opportunity to thank the two professors, Professor Yangxin and uh, Professor Yang Mengting again for your time at the insights for sharing. Uh, yeah, and also, yeah, for thank for my colleagues like Paul, yeah, from the your, our specialist group to do the all the organization. Um, so I also like to, yeah, again to share with with all of you regarding our your the upcoming the webinars and event. You could find more details from IWA website. Then the yeah so um the upcoming the uh, disinfection specialist uh, the group conference uh will be yeah since also more information for yeah just case our yeah we we will have a the up, upcoming conference uh in October in Spain and also more information you could also find the uh, on the IWA the the Congress websites then I. Look forward to your further engagement, and also thank you again for all your, for all of you for your time at the yeah very yeah protect proactive engagement, uh, and also the last but last the the yeah, last list, please don't forget that if you want to register for our the upcoming conference, do use the code and you will get twenty percent discount, um yeah as our member. So yeah, as you see, be end for today's webinar. Thank you again, yeah, for your time, and wish you have a nice day ahead. Thank you. <laughs>